All right, this is a recorded lecture for um, chapter 26, respiratory system. Um, this is 30 slides, and uh, we were not able to have this lecture because of traffic related to the presidential uh, visit on Wednesday. So um, we're going to go over the respiratory system, the um, primary structures of the respiratory system um, come in two parts. Um, we have upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract. Um, the pr primary purpose is gas exchange. Um, and that is an exchange of oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide at the level of the lungs. And um, the um, We will talk about the upper and lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract involves the um, nose, the mouth, the pharynx, the epiglottis, the larynx, and the trachea. And uh, here's a nice little diagram for you. The lower respiratory um, tract involves the bronchi, the bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, the alveoli, and the lung lobes. And again, here's a nice little picture for you. And uh, I'm going to say this several times, uh, and you probably have heard this in your pharmacology class. Um, albuterol is a drug that we use that is a um, bronchi bronchiodilator. Uh, we use that for several different reasons, but basically when the lungs spasm, um, we use that drug to uh, decrease the spasming and dilate. That helps patients um, breathe a little bit easier. Um, this is a diagram that I like very much that um, just kind of breaks down the structures of the lungs. The trachea is the largest um, portion of the um, the pipes in the lungs, if you will. Um, then we go into bronchi, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. The alveoli are the very small things that look like grapes at the, at the far right, and that's where your gas exchange starts. The bronchioles are surrounded by smooth muscles that constrict and dilate, um, and that's where your bronchodilation um, comes in with um, albuterol. Um, there is an anatomical dead space in the trachea and the bronchi, and uh, that's just, <laughs> even though we call it a dead space, it's, it's like a, um, a placeholder, think of a zero. It's always there, it's always going to be holding space. Um, it keeps the, the, uh, the vital uh, areas of the lungs open. In addition to that, um, and that's represented by capital letter V, small letter D, um, that's a placeholder. Um, the space does not exchange gases. There's also um, the tidal volume, and this is the amount of air that exchanged with each breath, and that is about 500 mils in an adult, and that's about the size of a, um, a bottle of water. This is a picture of um, uh, alveoli, and the top picture are healthy expanded alveoli, and the bottom picture are um, alveoli that are compressed, and uh, this is known as um, atelectasis. Um, atelectasis is something we don't like because these alveoli are not open and able to exchange air. If you uh, have ever heard of newborns um, or premature infants that are not able to breathe well, um, the drug surfactant is a drug that helps open these, um, these airways and newborns don't make this or preterm uh, pre infants don't make um, surfactant well so we have to give them that drug. Um, um, also, uh, adults that have acute um, respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, ARDS, 
Um, they also lack surf surfactant, and this contributes to widespread atelectasis. There are other reasons that you can have um, atelectasis. Some of them can be um, um, pus pockets, maybe from infection. Um, you can have foreign bodies that would cause infection, things like that. But in general, um, this is what an atelectasis area would look like. There are two types of blood supply that go to um, the lungs. You have the pulmonary and the bronchial blood supply. Um, and then you also have um, the chest wall structures that include the ribs, the pleura, and the diaphragm. So let's talk about those. Um, uh, well, let me back up and talk about that. Um, No, I think uh, we'll talk about ventilation first. Ventilation is inspiration and expiration. In inspiration moves air into the lungs and expiration moves air out of the lungs. Inspiration is the result of pressure changes. The diaphragm and the chest muscles increase the chest um, dimensions, creating negative pressure. Air rushes in, um, a higher pressure is created and air um, recoils out. Um, the work is best when muscles and lung tissues are uh, retain, uh, retain an elastic quality. Expiration is somewhat of a passive process. Um, we like lungs that are very elastic um, and will um, de-expand or um, get smaller on their own. And if you think of a balloon, uh, um, a fresh balloon, that when you blow into it, it forces air back on you. We like lungs that, that do that. Um, if you think of a, a, um, a patient that is a COPD or someone that has uh, lungs that are not that elastic, um, their lungs do not have the ability to push air out. And so they're not going to be breathing that well. If you think of an old balloon that's been inflated for a while, when you let the air out, that balloon doesn't um, go back to its original size. It goes back to something less than, or something much bigger than the original size. And that's what COPD lungs look like. Sometimes their problem isn't getting um, enough oxygen in. It's not being able to get enough um, air out of their lungs so that they can get oxygenated air in. Um, when we talk about compliance, we talk about the distendability, and this is a measure of the, of the ease of expansion of the lungs, and this is a product of elasticity of the lungs and the elastic recoil of the chest and the chest wall. When compliance is decreased, the lungs are more difficult to inflate. Um, compliance is increased when there is destruction of alveolar walls and loss of tissue elasticity, as in COPD. <clears throat> um, diffusion is the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide back and forth across the al alveolar capillary membranes and um, movement goes from high concentration to low concentration. <clears throat> So physiology of respiration, arterial blood gases, <clears throat> and you should know all about those. Those are your ABGs, and uh, I'm not going to have test questions on ABGs for you. Um, these are measured, uh, they determine the oxygenation status and the acid-base balance of the patient. <clears throat> um, it includes measures of the PaO2, the PaCO2. Um, the acidity or the pH, the bicarbonate uh, in the arterial blood. Uh, and then you can also measure um, the O2 uh, saturation based on either a direct measure or um, like a finger probe like this picture is showing. 
Um, <clears throat> you should know your normals just as good general nursing principles. You should know your normals um, for ABGs, for uh, good practice, nursing practice. Um, so <clears throat> here's a question for you. If you had a patient that was ambulating in the hall, you were walking with them, and they were um, typically satting along in the 90s, the mid 90s, and you had them up and walking, and all of a sudden their saturation, their O2 saturation drops down into the 80s, what would you do for them? Um, first of all, would you think that was uh, not a good thing or an okay thing? Because they're up walking around, it's normal for that um, O2 saturation to drop down into the 80s. Well, I would hope you would say, no, that's not normal. Um, so if you have this happen, we want to set that patient down right away. Um, take away their workload. They're not um, tolerating the activity well. And we would want to apply oxygen to them right away. <clears throat> We want to help them compensate their oxygen levels. We put oxygen on them, and uh, then we get the order um, as uh, pretty quickly as, as possible. You give the doctor a call and uh, or the provider and let them know what's going on. But set the patient down, put oxygen on them, and then get the order. Um, don't let them uh, decompensate in front of you. <clears throat> okay, and here is a little chart, and this is in your book. Um, these are just normal ABG values, and again, you should know these. This is ju just good nursing principle. You should know your ABGs. Um, <clears throat> respirations, uh, or the control of respiration, is um, caused by two different mechanisms, chemoreceptors and mechanical receptors. And the uh, um, chemoreceptors are located in the medu medulla, and they respond to changes in the hydrogen ion concentration. And then the peripheral chemoreceptors are located in the carotid bodies and at the bifurcation of the common carotid arteries. And then the mechanical receptors are located in the lungs, and these are in the upper airways, the chest wall, and the diaphragm. So just know that that's where um, those are located at. Um, let's talk about some of the respiratory defense mechanisms um, that your body has. So this is <clears throat> so the respiratory defense mechanisms are efficient in protecting the lungs from inhaled particles and microorganisms and toxic toxic gases. So first you have your nose, and that we hope helps filter some things out. Inside the nose, we have nasal hairs, and this helps filter out um, any type of inspired air um, particles. Below uh, the larynx, the movement of the mucus is accomplished. Well, you have the mucociliary clearance system, and that's below the, the larynx, and this is a system of mucus that your body produces so that if something does get into the um, past the, the the nose and the nasal passages, we hope it gets stuck in the mucus um, the uh, mucus system, uh, the mucociliary escalator is what it's called, and that your body will eventually move that up in a, a wave-like, finger-like action, the mucociliary escalator. Your body produces about 100 mil a day of Globulate cells and submucosal glands uh, form this. Um, and the purpose is to move debris out of your lungs. A cough clears the airway. Um, it produces a high pressure, high velocity flow of air. Um, we also have a we can have a reflex bronchoconstriction for those people that are sensitive to begin with. Um, once they start coughing, that bronco, bronchoconstriction can uh, turn into a reflexive uh, bronchoconstriction or spasming. And, um, and so we want to watch for that. 
And again, I go back to albuterol is a, um, a bronchodilator. Um, if this is the case, we look for um, triggers for bronchospasms or bronchoconstriction. Um, and then we also have alveolar macrophages, and these are rapidly uh, phagocyte, phagocytized um, inhaled foreign particles, such as um, bacteria. And the debris is moved to the level of the bronchioles for removal by the cilia. And again, it's all moved up through that um, mucosal um, uh, escalator system. <clears throat> okay, gerontological considerations. Um, in this case, they're defining gerontological as 50 and above, which is kind of scary. Um, we look at structural changes. So um, we see less chest expansion. We can see barrel-shaped chest, especially in people that have smoked for years. We see reduced muscle strength after age 50. The lungs are harder to inflate. They may require use of ancillary muscles. Um, this decreases in number of functional alveolar, alveoli and also less elasticity. Um, the respiratory defense mechanisms are less effective because of decreased immunities. And we did talk about this in our immunity less, uh, uh, lecture. Um, elderly have a decrease in their immunity system to begin with. When you combine that with less muscle strength, a less forceful cough, this predisposes the elderly to respiratory infections. And then the respiratory control is altered significantly in elderly with significantly uh, a significant smoking history with obesity and other chronic illnesses. So when you're doing an assessment on a COPD patient, um, and many of these are going to be elderly, what respiratory rate would you consider um, uh, would you consider um, reason for um, worry? I know your norms, 20 is, is uh, an average respiratory rate for a COPD, or it's not unlikely to have someone breathing a little bit more often than that. But um, at what point do you start getting worried about someone? Is it 20? Is it 24? Is it 28? At what point? Um, well, in this case, you want to look at the entire picture. A COPD -er is going to have a little, inc little more increased uh, respiratory um, distress. Um, you have to look at their, uh, the use of their ancillary muscles. Um, anytime they're getting close to respirations um, in the 30s, it's worrisome. Um, if their SATs are dropping, it's worrisome. If they have increased exertion, it's worrisome. So be aware that you need to put the whole picture together. But anytime you're popping up um, past 25, getting on upward into the 30s, that's a problem. That's going uh, to take its toll on someone very quickly. Uh, another thing, in any situation, when you have... Uh, breath sounds that sound abnormal in the bases. Um, crackles, crepitus, um, horse ronchi, rails, anything described like that in the bases, anything other than normal breath sounds in the bases, that is something that needs to be pointed out into the, uh, to the provider. Um, especially in our elderly patients, if you hear anything other than normal breath sounds in the bases, that's a worrisome situation, and you need to point that out right away because we know that our elderly don't have the ability to cough as hard as forcefully. They can't clear their secretions as, as uh, quickly or as forcefully. So any kind of bilateral crackles in the basis, um, we need to point that out right away. So that's important for you to know. Okay. Um, Subjective data, I'm going to let you uh, read this in the book, but in general, you look at the, the big picture, including the prescriptions and over-the-counter. 
um, drugs in their activity. Um, you do an objective assessment on them, including a physical examination. And again, I'm going to let you read most of this in the book, but I do want to point out um, slide 18, because you're going to have a question on this. I want you to be very, very um, sure in your assessment skills and the way you auscultate lung sounds. You know you go top to bottom, side to side, and do a comparison. Cushion and auscultation of the test chest should be performed in a planned sequence from top to bottom. It's important to compare sounds side to side. Follow the pattern noted, and here's the pattern. And I'll tell you the test question is more of what's the student doing wrong rather than what's the student doing right. So make sure you read this session section <coughs> so that um, you know um, what uh, a good auscultation uh, format is for chest sounds. Okay, and then this slide uh, talks about uh, percussion and um, this is something that's really hard to teach in lecture. Uh, my, my best advice for you is to go to YouTube and see if you can find some recordings of this and then grab your kid, your spouse, or your dog, and your stethoscope and start percussing and listening. Dogs love this. Um, they, they love to be thumped on. Um, so especially if you've got a big dog, they don't mind having their, their chest sounds and, and their, their lungs auscultated or thumped on at all. Um, but make sure you listen for the difference between a dull sound and a, uh, a resonant sound and a hyper-resonant sound. Um, but this is something that you just have to learn with experience. Um, and again, these are just um, places to, for placement that you put uh, your stethoscope and your, your percussive technique techniques in place. Um, okay. Breath sounds. Um, again, this is something that you have to learn um, through experience, but we typically um, define breath sounds um, as normal, which are very clear, or we can use some of the following terms to define abnormal, fine crackles, coarse crackles, ronchi, wheezes, strider, plural fiction rub. Um, a plural fiction, friction rub is easy to determine. Um, there's nothing like it. It sounds like two pieces of leather being rubbed together. Wheezes, you're never gonna miss um, because you can hear them down the hall, especially when it's a kid and they have parents that are panicking. Once you hear them, you'll know exactly what it is. Um, strider and wheezes can be very similar. The fine crackles, coarse crackles, and ronchi are all going to be more what you hear with a stethoscope. Um, and um, you'll get the hang of that the more you do. The fine crackles sound a lot like cellophane. If you take cellophane and kind of um, twist that by your ear, some people will describe it as um, hair, I never did get that. Um, I, I think it's more like cellophane, but again, it's very subjective. So um, you just have to use your skills and figure out what you think it sounds like. Um, the way we assess and diagnose some of the uh, respiratory studies, we use um, sputum studies, and we can do this two ways if your patient is uh, able to cough up um, a, uh, a glob of um, whatever they're coughing and spit it into a container, that's good, that's spontaneous. If they can't, and some of them are, are just too weak, they can't cough it out, we can induce. Um, and usually we go down with a tube and suck it out. Usually respiratory does that for us. Um, these are sent off 
to lab. Um, they're examined for culture and sensitivity. So if we're going to get one of these, and um, they're for culture and sensitivity, what do we want to do first before we start an antibiotic? We want to get the sputum study first before we start an antibiotic, right? Okay, so a skin test. Um, you've probably all had the skin test for like TB. And um, just because you have a positive skin test does, for TB doesn't mean you have TB. It just means you've been exposed to the um, to be uh, somewhere along the line. Um, okay. Then you can also do um, bronchoscopy. And this is done with a uh, fiber optics scope. Um, these are kind of fun to watch. Um, they'll either go down the nose or put a bite block in the mouth and go through the mouth. The patient is sedated for this. So this is going to be once the patient comes back to the floor. <coughs> <coughs> once the patient comes back to the floor, this is going to be a high priority patient for you because they will have been uh, had sedation. And you're going to do um, frequent vital signs on this patient. But they basically go down. Um, the lungs uh, and look in the bronchi, the bronchioles, um, and uh, as far as they can go, the bronchus, uh, and if they can get into the alveoli um, to that level, it just depends on the patient. And they're looking for anything they can see. They're looking for infection, for foreign bodies, for whatever it is they can see. Um, they will obtain specimens, they'll do washings. Um, they will inject, or not inject, they'll instill saline um, and do a lavage and wash out the ear area. Um, let's see. So yes, this patient will be sedated. They'll be on frequent post-op checks. They are a high priority um, patient when they come back to the floor. So if you're given um, five patients to take care of, um, this is probably one of your first patients that you want to check on because they have had sedation. Um, let's see, what else do we need to tell you? We'll talk about that. Um, again, I have a note on my, um, my uh, paper here about um, bubbling sounds, low-pitched bubbling sounds in the lower one-third of lungs on inspiration crackles in the bases that's not normal doesn't matter if we're talking about respiratory or skeletal muscles that's not a normal breath sound so that needs to be pointed out to the um the doctor um okay here's another picture of how we do a bronchoscopy this one, the, the patient is still sedated, but they're sitting up. They're, they're at a 45 degree angle and they're sitting up. It just depends on the, um, the physician and how they want the patient. Um, we can also do lung biopsies. They can do them transbronchially, percutaneously, um, or transthoracic needle aspiration. Those are done in LR. And the purpose of these are to obtain tissue cells or secretions by, uh, for evaluation. And it can be video assisted thoracic surgery. And then we can also do an open biopsy where they actually take the patient in surgery and open the chest cavity. Um, there's a picture of a tran transbronchial biopsy. Here's a thoracentesis, and this is something you'll do at the bedside. I've assisted on several of these. Um, and these are kind of fun to do. They're, um, um, the patient is <coughs> given local sedation at the site of insertion. It's painful, but it's not that bad. You're going to sit them up on the side of the bed. You put the overbed table in front of them and put pillows on it and have their arms stretched out in front of them so that that opens up their, their rib areas um, and the 
um, provider uh, can get two of your berries to do the, the thoracentesis. They're going to insert a large bore needle through the chest wall into the um, pearl space and obtain specimens. Uh, sometimes you're going to draw a fluid. Um, they might actually put a chest tube in at this point. Um, again, the patient is positioned and is sitting upright with the elbows on the overbed table um, and the feet supported. Um, that's important. That's going to be on your test. You need to know that. Okay. Then other things we can do are pulmonary function tests, PFTs, um, and this measures lung volumes uh, and airflow. Um, PFTs, you have to coach your patient. Um, the, um, you instruct them to blow out completely and take a large breath and then um, encourage them to blow as hard and as far as they can. Um, they've got a clip on their nose so they cannot breathe in and out through their nose and they're blowing into what looks like a, a, a pipe with tubes. Um, there is verbal coaching, and this is to ensure that the patient continues to blow out until ex exhalation is complete. Um, let's see, we can do exercise testing. Um, and that's a patient walking six minutes. Um, there's not many COPD that can walk six minutes um, for an exercise test, though. Um, so going back to for the PFT, the patient is educated that they will need to blow out as hard as they can during the PFT. That's important for you to know. Um, just keep that in mind. And then we have some radiology exams. We can do a chest x-ray. I bet you're all familiar with that. We can do computed tomography or a CT scan. And when we do a CT scan, those are usually ordered with and without um, uh, dye. If it's ordered without, there's not a problem. Uh, if they're ordered with, we need to make sure that the patient is not allergic to iodine or shellfish. Um, I would advise you to always ask your patient, regardless of, it, of whether it's ordered without, to still go ahead and ask this question because at the drop of a hat, the radiologist may be looking at the images and saying, well, I don't see what we're looking for. So let's go ahead and um, shoot it with dye. And if you've already answered the question, then it's not a problem. Um, that's important for you to know that uh, iodine or shellfish um, is something that we're looking for when we uh, do a CT scan. Um, we can do MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, ventilation, perfusion, do two scans. We're looking for embolisms there. Pulmonary angiograms, we're looking at the structure of the, um, the lungs. And we can do positron emission uh, tomography, PET scans. And that is the end of this slide presentation. Now, let me just look through my notes here a minute, make sure I've gotten everything. Um, After a bronchoscopy, this patient is going to be in PO until their gag reflex returns. So make sure that that's going to be a high priority patient when they come back because you're going to be doing frequent vital signs, but you're also going to be watching for their gag reflex to return. Um, when you do your lung assessments, the patient needs to be uh, breathe slow and deep. You know that bases are uh, crackles in the bases uh, bilaterally is not normal. Um, and I think that's it. I think I got everything. So we'll move on to chapter 27 in the next video.